today we're starting a new unit on the gen on genetics, uh, the genetic basis of life, and we're going to start with what we call the cell cycle or cellular reproduction. So if you remember from one of our earlier lectures, we had five components that defined something as a living thing. And number four on that list was that living things must be able to reproduce and develop. So that's what we're going to be talking about today. That's what we're focusing on is this ability for the cell to reproduce. We're going to also tie that in with the cell theory that we talked about that had three components to it. The third of which is that cells come from pre-existing cells. So we're starting out with one cell reproducing into new cells and that um, helps to define it as a living organism. So we're going to start talking about the cell cycle of eukaryotic cells. And the question is why undergo cell division at all? And there are three primary purposes. One is just growth and development of tissues and organs. Um, second is to repair and regenerate tissues that have been damaged. So in other words, if we um, have cut something, then like say you cut your finger, we need to repair that muscle tissue and that skin tissue. And so we need cell division of the healthy cells around it in order to um, repair that particular um, tissue. And the third reason is asexual reproduction. And that's gonna make a little more sense in comparison to sexual reproduction, which uses a totally different um, type of division. So asexual reproduction, uh, for example, in certain plants, in order to make a new plant, we just divide the cells of the one plant. So that's asexual reproduction. It doesn't involve gametes. I want to start by just talking about some terminology. That way it'll be easier as we go through the process so that all these words will start to sound familiar to you. So first of all, let's talk about chromosomes. Because I'm sure you've heard that term before, and I don't know if you know exactly what it means, but it means strands of packed DNA. And so if you'll remember um, when we were talking about biomolecules and we talked about DNA and RNA, um, DNA is a double helix structure. So we see that right here. And in order to make it nice and packed so that it fits into the nucleus, um, the cell does some fun things. So if you think about a human uh, chromosome is about six meters in length. That's really huge. And it packs so tightly that it can be as small as um, six micrometers. So that's a huge difference. So let's see how it gets there. Essentially, the double helix gets wound really tightly and then it gets wrapped around what we call histones, which are a particular type of protein that's responsible for um, organizing and packing the DNA. And so once it's wrapped around a cluster of about eight histones, we call that a nucleosome. And at that stage, our DNA is going to look like a string of pearls, basically, and those pearls are the nucleosomes. And then um, all of that is going to start binding together. Those nucleosomes pack in a very specific way. And so at this point in time, we have what's that's called chromatin. So chromosomes is when it's super packed tight. When it's not packed quite as tight, that's called chromatin. And um, on the next slide, I'll show you what that looks like within the nucleus. Um, but we have what we call two different types of chromatin. There's euchromatin. And what that means is it's the parts of the DNA that are actively being transcribed. So those genes are um, being actively transcribed into proteins. And then we have what's called heterochromatin, and heterochromatin is much tighter packed, and it's not being transcribed at the moment. So it makes sense that for all of the um, hardware that needs to come in in order to transcribe DNA, it's gotta have space. So chromatin, although um, the DNA is wound and organized and tight, it's loose enough that that hardware can come in and transcribe the DNA. That's euchromatin. Heterochromatin is packed super tight so that 
nothing is being transcribed. Now, before the cell divides, we need to pack that DNA super tight so it's easier to move and manipulate and chain and, and move around the cell. And when we do that, that's what we call our chromosome. So that's right down here. So we have loops of that heterochromatin that's really tight, packed even tighter in, and um, with the help of these protein scaffolds to make what we call chromosomes. So when we look at um, our DNA, one thing that might be interesting for you to know is that 50% of it involves proteins, and a lot of it are these um, histones and the scaffold proteins. All that make up about 50% of that um, chromosome structure. Okay, so that's some terminology um, just to be helpful as we move on. Within our cell, we're going to have our nucleus, like you have studied before. Here is our nuclear pores of our nuclear envelope. Here inside is our nucleolus. And all throughout here is our chromatin that we talked about. And so the image on the right is just an electron micrograph of a nucleus. And you can see the euchromatin is stained a little bit lighter because it's spread out a little more. And the heterochromatin is, has a darker stain because it's more densely packed. So when our heterochromatin gets coiled and packed even tighter into these supercoils, we have what's called our chromosome, and that's right here. And so if we're looking at the number of chromosomes that various organisms have. I, there are just a few of them down here in this chart. And so like our roundworm has four chromosomes. We as humans have 46. Dogs have 78. So what do all these chromosomal numbers have in common? What they had in common was that the number of chromosomes was always even. And that's because our chromosomes come in pairs. So this right here is a picture showing all the pairs of chromosomes in a normal human male. And that picture is called a karyotype. And remember we said that um, humans had 46 pairs of, or 46 chromosomes, 23 pairs. And so we call this state a diploid state or a diploid organism, which means that they contain two complete sets of chromosomes. One comes from each parent. The image on the left here is an electron micrograph, super high powered for scanning electron micrograph of a chromosome. And so I just wanted to give you again some terminology so that you'll understand as we pass through the cell cycle what we're talking about. So each chromosome then is made up, um, we have sister chromatids, and this central region is called the centromere, so that's easy to remember. And then there are these proteins attached to them called kinetochores, and we'll, you'll figure out what those are used for later, but right now I just wanted you to see what the structure looks like of the chromosome moving forward. All right, now that we know our terminology, now let's get started with the cell cycle itself. So the cell cycle is essentially the life cycle of a particular cell. And just like various organisms have different lengths of their life cycle, so do cells. So some cells, like embryonic cells that are uh, dividing real quickly, their cell cycle is going to be very short. Other cells, such as in mature adults, are going to be longer. They may be 20 hours long before they ever divide. But the cell cycle itself is pretty much divided into two main phases with subphases within that. So the first phase is what we call interphase, and that's the longest. That's this purple right here. And that's kind of divided into growth, um, growth and DNA replication, and then more growth and final preparation for cell division. So this is the time of the cell cycle where most, where the cell spends most of its time. So um, it used to be thought of as like the resting phase, um, and it can still be that to some extent, but it's also preparation for 
the mitotic phase, which is the second phase of the cell cycle, and that's this blue right here. And so mitosis is just cell division, and we'll talk about that. So those are the two main phases of the cell cycle, interphase and then mitosis. And so we're gonna um, talk in detail about each one of these phases. It's important to know that throughout these phases, there are what we call checkpoints. And that just is a way that the cell says, okay, are we good to go? Do we have everything lined up before we start the next phase? And if not, then let's go back and correct that before we move on. So the interphase part of the cell cycle, you can think of it as starting with a baby cell, a brand new cell. It's pretty small. It comes with its centrosomes, with uh, each having a centriole pair. And then there's our nucleus that you're used to with the chromatin inside of it and a plasma membrane, just your standard cell. And interphase has three parts to it. The first stage of interphase is G1, or what we call the first gap. And this is where the cell cycle starts. So we have our baby cell, and this is when cell, the cell itself grows in size. So if you can picture um, the cytoplasm getting bigger and bigger, um, this is when those mitochondria are gonna be working hard because we need a lot of energy to grow this cell. And during this uh, particular phase, we have replication of all the organelles within the cell because once we have grown the cell, now we're actually preparing it for our mitotic stage that's gonna come up. So if we're going to replicate a cell, we'd have to replicate all the organelles within it. So that happens in the G1 phase. Next comes the S phase, and S stands for DNA synthesis. So all of the DNA within the cell is replicated. We need two copies if we're going to then produce two daughter cells. Um, then the third part of interphase is G2, or what we call the second gap. And this is where the cell makes all the enzymes that are necessary for the mitotic phase. So that's three parts to interphase. We start with a baby cell, we grow it, we replicate all the organelles, replicate all the DNA, and make all the enzymes necessary for the mitotic stage. So G2 ushers us into the second phase of the cell cycle, which is called the mitotic phase. And the mitotic phase actually includes mitosis, which has several stages to it, and all mitosis is, is a nuclear division. And then cytokinesis, which is the division of the cytoplasm. So <clears throat> what we're going to do is start with a parent cell, and then um, through the process of mitosis and cytokinesis, we're gonna end up with two daughter cells. And when we undergo mitosis, the genetic makeup of those daughter cells is identical to the genetic makeup of the parent cell. That's not gonna be true when we start talking about meiosis, and that is for another lecture, but I just wanted you to be able to distinguish between the two. With mitosis, the daughter cells have the exact same genetic material as the parent cell that it started out with. So the first stage of mitosis is what we call prophase. And during prophase, the nuclear envelope starts to break down. And also in this stage, the chromosomes condense. So they're gonna become very clear. And what we call mitotic spindles begin to form. Mitotic spindles are basically microtubules that are going to assist in pulling the chromosomes apart during cell division. But if we look under a microscope right now, we would be able to see that that nuclear envelope is beginning to break down and we're gonna see the chromosomes condense. This second stage is called pro-metaphase or right before metaphase. And during this phase, the kinetochores or proteins form on the chromosomes and they act as points of attachment for those spindle fibers. So this picture on the left you've seen before, that was when I was showing you what a chromosome looks like. And so in that is the kinetochore. And so that's right here. And it's on each of these sister chromatids. 
um, sister chromatids are basically when the DNA has replicated, so each one of these chromatids has the exact same set of genes. <coughs> and so here we are, here's the chroma, uh, sorry, here's the kinetochore, and that's where these spindle fibers, those microtubules, are going to attach on each side, um, each to its own kinetochore. So during metaphase, this is when all the sister chromatids line up in the middle of the cell. So meta meaning middle. Um, they line up on, on this imaginary line, and we call that the metaphase plate. And so if you look um, at the image of these cells, you can see that there's this straight line in the middle. And notice that the um, centrioles are here and here, and from them the spindle fibers radiate like this and attach to the kinetochores of each chromatid. So this is a very easy phase to see under the microscope. So here you have all those sister chromatids lined up in the center. So that is metaphase. During anaphase, the attachments between the sister chromatids where we have the centromere breaks down and the spindle fibers pull one chromatid to each side of the cell. So we are separating those sister chromatids. So honestly, the way I, I have always remembered this since I learned it in high school, I think, is that Anna is like some mean girl named Anna that pulls apart the sisters. So that's how I remember that. Hope that's useful to you. <laughs> um, but again, an easy um, stage to see under the microscope as you start to see those chromatids pull apart. And then we have telophase. Telophase is when two nuclear envelopes start forming and the chromosomes start to decondense. And this phase takes place at the same time as cytokinesis. So this is sort of the final phase of mitosis, so the final phase of the nuclear division. And it is taking place at the same time as the cytoplasmic division. So cytokinesis works a little bit differently in animal cells versus plant cells. So let's start with animal cells. Remember cytokinesis is just the division of the cytoplasm. So basically all the bulk of the cell has been made and now we just need to split it in two. And so in animal cells we have what's called a cleavage furrow. And so that is actually made because of what we have called contractile rings. That contractile ring is made up of microfilaments, which is the actin portion of the cytoskeleton. And it basically just squeezes between the two portions and basically pinches it off into two cells. So when that begins to contract, we call that portion the um, cleavage furrow. And then that pinches off and then we have the division into two separate cells. Cytokinesis in plant cells, however, is a little bit different. Um, there's no cleavage furrow. Instead, we form a new cell wall between those two cells, um, and that, that portion along there is what we call a cell plate. So in this image, it's right here. And vesicles send cell wall material to form this cell plate, and that cell plate divides uh, the two, the cytoplasm of those two now new daughter cells. So this is just a quick look at the difference between cytokinesis in animal cells versus plant cells. So in cytopla uh, the cytoplasm divides into two in animal cells via a cleavage furrow. In plant cells, a cell plate forms between the new cells. So when we're thinking about our cell cycle and remembering that our body is made up of all kinds of different cell types, then we need to talk about cell cycle regulation. So if we're talking about, um, just giving examples here, adult neuron cells, blood stem cells, and liver cells, which one of those would never divide, divides every day, or divides sometimes? Well, an adult neuron never divides. So that's important for you to think about when we are killing brain cells, right? They don't regenerate um, once we've hit adulthood. So it's important to take care of that brain. Um, blood stem cells, 
they divide every day. That's sort of the idea of stem cells that the, is that they're constantly dividing. And liver cells will divide sometimes. So clearly different cell types need um, to go through the cell cycle uh, at, uh, at different rates. So we need to regulate the cell cycle. The way we regulate the cell cycle is through signals, signaling mechanisms. So what we call cell sig, uh, sorry, cell cycle signals. Wow, that's a lot of s sound. Um, and so these cell cycle signals are molecules that tells the cell either to divide, to not divide, or to die. So the first one of these is what we call the, a growth factor. And that's a signal that promotes cell division. And so a growth factor is usually a hormone um, that will attach to its receptor protein on the plasma membrane and go through a signal transduction pathway that then starts the cell division process. Another cell cycle signal is what we call PDGF, which is platelet-derived growth factor. So another growth factor, usually a hormone or a protein, um, and that stimulates cell growth um, at, of epidermal cells or your skin cells, and that is a promotion for regrowth in an area after injury. So hopefully I'm not grossing anybody out with these pictures, but if you had your hand cut or your finger um, and it was stitched back up, your body produces PDGF and that stimulates your skin cells at that injured site to grow. Now what happens after that growth is complete um, is what we call contact inhibition. So if you uh, think about these skin cells, this being the injury site, as these cells here and here begin to divide and make new cells and those cells grow and um, form contact. Once that contact forms, then that is a signal to the cell cycles to stop dividing. We don't need it anymore, so we're good. So that is called contact inhibition. Okay, so so far we've talked about uh, signals that tell the cells to divide, those that tell it to stop dividing, and what about signals to die? Did you ever think about the fact that your cells sometimes need to die? Um, this is a process that we call apoptosis, or programmed cell death, and it's usually initiated by either cell damage, so if a cell is damaged, we just want to kill it off, reabsorb all those materials and put that to use somewhere else. And so this is usually started um, when uh, apoptosis signals come to the injured cell and that cell begins to shrink. The chromatin um, condenses very tightly so that it can't be reversed. And then the cell starts to become fragmented and put into small little vesicles or apopto apoptotic bodies. And from that, then the macrophages from your lymph system can come in and engulf those fragments, um, basically digest them. So other than injured cells or injured parts of cells, when would we need to have apoptosis? Well, a frog is probably one of the best examples of useful apoptosis. So we start out um, fertilization happens in the water, so tadpoles form and they need a tail so that they can swim within the water. Well, when it comes time uh, for maturation and metamorphosis, those tail cells are going to need to die. So they undergo apoptosis. So within the cell cycle, we have what's called checkpoints. And that at those checkpoints, you either ha get a yes, you can go on to the next phase of the cell cycle, or no, something is wrong and you cannot go on to the next phase. And there are three major checkpoints. The first checkpoint is uh, the G1 checkpoint. So it's in that G1 part of, inter of interphase. And this is when the cell checks to make sure that the DNA is not damaged. Um, if it is damaged, then apoptosis will occur. If it's not damaged, 
then the cell can proceed on to the S phase and replicate that DNA. Then our next checkpoint comes in the G2 phase. And that, is, that phase, remember, is right before mitosis. So what that is essentially double checking is to make sure that the DNA has replicated properly. If it hasn't, again, apoptosis will occur, but if it has, then the cell can then proceed into the mitotic phase. Well, halfway through the mitotic phase is another checkpoint. It's called the M checkpoint. And that essentially just makes sure that the spindle assembly is um, correct. So it, the chromosomes need to be properly aligned because if they're not, then we are going to take wrong parts of a chromosome here. Maybe we get um, some chromosomes going to one cell but not to the other and that can be problematic. So smack dab in the middle of the mitotic phase is our M checkpoint, making sure that the chromosomes are properly aligned. And if they are, then we continue on. Um, and that usually happens between metaphase and anaphase. So one thing you may have noticed in this slide that we haven't talked about yet is this Z, uh, sorry, G0 phase right here. And all that means is that is for cells that are not going to divide. So our adult neuron cells, for instance, are stuck in this G0 phase. And so everything else proceeds just as you would see it here. And you'll need to know the order that this goes in. So G1, S, G2, and then prophase, prometaphase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase, and then cytokinesis. And that arrow coming off here after cytokinesis this is a new cell that's going to go through the same entire cycle again, okay? So what controls the checkpoints? Essentially, the checkpoints are controlled by cell cycle proteins, or sorry, cell cycle control proteins called CDK and cyclin. And so throughout interphase, CDK um, is cycled through and mitotic cyclin is building up. And once that concentration hits a certain point, with the two of them together, um, the mitotic phase is entered. At the end of the mitotic phase, the cyclin is degraded and the CDK is left alone without the cyclin and the cycle goes through interphase. So what happens when these checkpoints are ignored or the CDK and cyclin are unrecognized. Cancer is what happens when those signals that tell the cell to stop the cell cycle get ignored. And so cancer is essentially uncontrolled growth, usually undifferentiated growth of cells as well. And so it's all because of those cell signals, our CDKs and our cyclins being completely ignored. Usually that starts with one particular cell that has mutated in such a way that either it can't recognize those signals or it doesn't make those signals, any number of reasons why those signals are not recognized. And once that one cell has that mutation, then it continues to just grow um, unchecked and then cancer metastasizes when those cells can then go into either your lymphatic system or your blood vessels and spread somewhere else and create um, more tumors elsewhere. So here's just a look at the difference between normal cells and cancer cells. So in our cancer cells, we tend to have very large nuclei with um, relatively small cytoplasmic volume and cancer cells just look weird so if you've ever gone to the dermatologist and they said oh we just want to take a look at this you know mole or freckle that doesn't look normal they're looking under the microscope to see um, do we have like conformity in cell size and shape or do we just have this whole disorganized arrangement of cells and then cancer cells also use, tend to lose their specialized features and um, accentuate other features and even genetic cell markers. Um, so genetically, you can see the difference between them as well. But I'm not gonna go into cancer in any more detail. You do have an additional assignment um, about cancer, so you can learn a little bit more there. We're gonna move on to cell division in prokaryotic cells. 
Okay, so prokaryotic cell division. Remember, our prokaryotes are in the domain bacteria and in the domain archaea, and they are always single-celled organisms. And so I love this text message because it pretty much sums up prokaryotic cell division. That, <laughs> that small zero getting to a larger one, cleaving into two, that pretty much simplifies it. Um, and it is called binary fission. So here's a more detailed look at that binary fission. Remember that um, these are going to be our prokaryotic cells. So they don't have a nucleus. They don't have membrane-bound organelles. So we don't have to worry about duplicating those things. We don't have a nuclear membrane that we have to break down. But we do need to double the volume of the cell, so increase the amount of cytoplasm, um, which is going to require a lot of ATP production. Um, and then we are also doubling things like the cytoskeleton. And then, of course, our uh, chromosome is going to be uh, duplicated as well because we need to duplicate the genetic material. That's the whole point of cell division most of the time. Um, and so then we have two identical um, chromosomes. And then once we, <coughs> excuse me, um, once that volume of the cell increases so much that basically one cell can't hold it all, then those two parts of the cells begin, begin to pull apart and pinch off, and essentially then we have two um, bacteria cells. Now, it's important uh, to know that when we duplicate the DNA here um, in bacteria, it is not as efficient as our processes in mitosis. And so we often do have mutations here and there. Um, there are still checkpoints, however, they don't tend to be as stringent as they are in eukaryotic cells, so that's why oftentimes you will have um, quick mutations within bacteria populations, not to mention they ha also have a um, quick life cycle, so they are replicating very quickly. Um, so that is our summary of our prokaryotic cell division. Um, the next slide, I do have a video if you'd like to see a comparison between uh, prokaryotic binary, division, binary fission versus eukaryotic mitosis. So in summary, uh, the functions of cell division are in prokaryotes and eukaryotes alike, they are used for asexual reproduction. In other words, reproducing um, of this reproduction of the same species, um, and that's accomplished in prokaryotes using binary fission, and in eukaryotes using mitos uh, mitosis and cytokinesis. Now, additionally, eukaryotes, um, such as plants and animals, use cell division as a means of development, growth, and repair as well. So all of this is the mitosis side of things. Um, we are going to do different kinds of cell division uh, next time. So just make sure that you understand the cell cycle, um, the different stages of it, and what's involved in each one, and what um, causes those phases to move forward, what causes them to stop, and just um, eukaryotic versus prokaryotic cell division. Okay, see you next time.